Welcome back to Week T Gaming. What's up, YouTube? Today's video is taken from our Torment Tides of Numenera live streams. If you're not familiar, Torment is an isometric RPG uh, that includes a lot of reading. So please sit back, enjoy story time, and give us a like or a comment on the video at the end. So Rin, Rin's supposed to be in here, yeah? This house was reduced to rubble when part of the cliff face collapsed. There's evidence that squatters have slept here recently. Ragged blanket, rotted fruit peelings, and footprints in the dust itself. Something scratches deep within the rubble. It sounds like someone or something is in there. Hello? The rubble makes no response. Dig deeper. You crawl partway inside, pushing aside boards and a thin slab of slate. Small girl gasps, throwing up a hand to block the sudden light. She's young, no more than 10 or 11 years old. She has made herself as small as possible to fit inside the tiny gap in the rubble. Her hair is dark and curly. She pulls herself deeper into the rubble, away from you. Why are you hiding in there? She puts a finger to her lips, then tries to shoo you away. You hear a voice behind you. I told you patience would pay off, lads. Some thugs stroll over. They, they all carry weapons at their sides, though they walk with the cocky assurance of those who don't expect to need them. I swear, I checked this hovel, says one of them. She wasn't here. No one was. How did this draft find her so easily? He gestures dismissively in your direction. Don't fret it, Bega. The thug looks you up and down, then calls out in the direction of the rubble. Come on, little bird. Doesn't matter how good you are at hiding. You had to come out sometime. <clears throat> the girl huddles behind you, keeping you between her and the thugs. Even so, it's obvious she's not sure about you either. Don't let them take me, please! <clears throat> um, why don't you want to go with them? One of the men interrupts. She's lost, he says. The little urchin ran away from, from her home. Her mother asked us to find her and bring her back safely. Is that true? No, she grabs your wrist. They're bad men. They want to steal me. Kidnappers. Now that's just crude. The man crosses his arms. We're delivery men. That's all. The means and motivations of our employers ain't none of our business. <clears throat> he sighs, dropping his facade. He turns to you with a look that pleads for understanding. But all right, yeah. There is a slaver who put up a fine bounty if we bring her back. It's all legal and none of your business. Best you stay out of it. He says the words kindly enough, but his colleagues' hands are on their weapons. It's not like I want to work for slavers, but jobs are scarce as it is. You can't take me. Her grip tightens on your wrist. Her grip on your wrist tightens. He found me. He has the discoverer's right. <clears throat> he raises an eyebrow, a bemused smirk playing on his face. Is that so? Well, Spider Jack, what do you say? Is she coming with us, or are we taking her from you? <clears throat> hmm. Let's try to intimidate. He narrows his eyes. Something in your demeanor sets him off. His eyes widen and he takes a step back. Fine. She ain't worth the trouble anyway. Yeah, go on now, get. Oh God, thank you. They were going to take me back to that woman. I've never met anyone so cruel. When she found me the first time she even... <clears throat> my apologies, I'm still out of sorts. You have my thanks and grace, sir. For a moment, it looks like she might hug you, but at the last moment she seems to think better of it and pulls up short, a half dozen steps away. She collects herself, standing straight with her shoulders back. Then she nods, the gesture so polite it's almost my formal. My name is Rin. 
My home and hearth and bread are yours to use. Except I don't have any of those things. She blushes then, looking around self-consciously. How long were you hiding in that building? She blinks a little as if confused or surprised at your question. Then she looks around, shifting nervously from foot to foot. I... This is my place. This is where I sleep. This is your home? She looks at the shattered wreckage. No, this is just where I was staying. I ran away from... I ran away. My home is a long way from here. Where are you from? She looks out at the horizon and makes a vague gesture. Really far away. But I'm not sure exactly which direction. She looks around a little, almost as if she were seeking a familiar landmark. It has to be a long way from here. My home isn't anything like this. There were trees upon trees. The trees here aren't trees, like. The young girl squints off into the distance. After a moment, her eyes go distant, and you realize she probably isn't going to finish her sentence. Uh, you were saying something about trees? She looks at you oddly. What? No, I wasn't. Without seeming to realize what she's doing, the girl brushes her hand through her hair, and you see the side of her head has been shaved. Large stitches run along her scalp, holding together an ugly cut longer than her hand. The wound is purple and angry looking, only just beginning to heal. Can't be more than a week old. What's the little girl doing here all alone? The girl looks up at you, her forehead creasing a little in irritation. My name is Rin. But then she hesitates and looks down, blinking. She reaches into her pocket absentmindedly. Did I forget to tell him that? She stands there motionless for a second, then stops and looks up at you again. No, I think I did. She looks up at you. I'm sorry, she says. My name is Rin. My food and fire are yours to use before you go. What happened to your head? Her body grows tense for a moment, her eyes darting around as if deciding whether or not to run away. She glances at the rubble where she had hidden from the thugs. She relaxes, though her eyes are still weary. I was running away. There were some people, bad people. I ran away and got hurt. Looks pretty bad. Are you okay? She makes a dismissive gesture toward her temple. It's fine. Looks a lot worse than it is, and a lot better than yours anyway. She smirks, touching the side of her head. The haircut is pretty awful though, isn't it? I don't think they really needed to shave quite this much, do you? I don't know, it looks kind of fashionable. She gives a wide grin. I'll be the envy of every homeless waif in this entire... She gestures grandly at the landscape, then hesitates. Barrow? Her grin fades as the word comes out of her mouth. Sorry, I meant Barrow. She pauses, then says, I know that's not the right word. I mean, Barrow. Her grin is entirely gone now, and her hands make fists as she looks down at the ground, concentrating. Her lips move, and at first you can't hear anything except for the hint of a whisper. Finally, her body relaxes. Yes, neighborhood. That's the word I was looking for. Neighborhood. She looks up and gives you a shaky smile. I offer apologies. It's been a long day. Uh, what people were you running away from? She opens her mouth and closes it again. She nods and puts her hand back into her pocket absentmindedly. I don't really remember. I think they were stealers. No. What's the word? Robbers? They wanted to rob me. Who fixed your head? For just a moment, her eyes flash with panic again, and they dart around like she's getting ready to run. Then she touches the side of her head gingerly. I don't remember what happened exactly, but I got away, and I ran, and I ended up here. Your story's kind of weird here. She scowls at you fiercely. I didn't know I was talking to a judge, she says angrily. I told you I can't remember. Not for days on either side of whatever happened. She looks away, mouth pressed into a firm line. Sorry, Ren, I was trying to help. Seems like you've had a rough couple of days. She gives a wavering smile. Oh, it's not all bad. I found some shimmery berries today. So that means I get to play. I wonder if this will poison me later. That's always exciting. 
Is there anything I can do to help? She shrugs nonchalantly. I don't know. I'm pretty good here. Unless you happen to have any spare food you aren't using, or water, or a blanket, or a new bed, or a house, or, you know, anything at all. Rin starts out talking with a playful smile on her face, but then her eyes well up. Her voice stays cheerful, even as the tears are running down her cheeks. She wipes them away, embarrassed and angry, but her hands are shaking now, and there are more tears, and words continue to pour out of her. I offer apologies. It's just that I've been hungry for days. I don't know where I am. My head hurts, and nothing makes sense. She laughs then, hel helplessly, with a tinge of trembling panic finally bleeding into her tone. God's around me. I'm all broken in my head. The moon is wrong, and I'm so tired of being scared all the time. Let's give her some shins. We should take her with us, but we, we have a party right now. She blinks at the money in her hand, then looks to you and gives a small, awkward curtsy. Thanks and grace, sir. Truly. Alright, catch you later, Ren. Check out the shield generator, huh? This silent and ancient machine casts a sh long shadow. As you study it, your breath stutters in your chest and your hands shake. You can't help feeling as though you have stood in the exact spot before. Examine the device. The jumble of mismatched parts make up this once functional generator. You notice a familiar circonate symbol etched into the metal like a maker's mark. Yep. Always the same. These generators, always the same. Hey, buddy. This old man's skin is covered in makeup, painstakingly drawn to resemble dark stone. His eyes widen briefly as he notices you, and his face and neck hardens into actual obsidian for a moment. Then he smiles and nods at you, his features mobile once more. Welcome, welcome, he says. Sorry about the stone. Polymorphic flesh modification, you see. Didn't see you walk up, and I assumed you were going to cut my throat and take my chirurgical parlor, Chir chirurgical, Chir surgical parlor for your safe self. Hey, day's young. His face flashes into obsidian for a split second before flushing into copper. The old man is blushing. Apologies, apologies, he says. I knew you were joking, but the modifications are touchier about such things. And really, I'm glad they are. If I were a younger man looking to make a name for myself in the city, I'd kill me too. Certainly he's joking. If he's not, well, the strongest will survive, I guess. My churgical parlor is a marvel of the prior world, you see. Just pick an item or a service, pay my outrageous fees, and after a, only a short to long period of fairly safe but indescribable agony, you walk away with some horrible Numenera bits whirring away inside of you. He pokes a few buttons on a device strapped to his wrist, and lights twinkle across its length. A dark, glassy lens focuses on you. Well, interested? Can't help noticing that you're a very honest man. Well spotted, he says, nodding. Clear streaks of quartz run up his prominent cheekbones, revealing the muscle beneath. It's a side effect of my modifications. Couldn't lie to you if you begged me to, he shrugs. Honesty is usually a hindrance to a businessman, but people seem to like it. It's a blessing, in my opinion. How did you come to own this parlor? It was originally a partnership, he says. My colleague and I spent two years digging it out and getting the whole mess working. He sighs. Of course, we had to test the drones before we tried them on anyone else. Customers getting skinned alive on opening day is bad for business. Turns out that was a wise move. Gorna chose an intelligence modification and the drones cut off his head to work on it more directly. Meyer picked strength and the drone sliced off her arms. They defaulted to sever in those days. He smiles fondly. Anyway, six partners later, I was the sole proprietor. Uh, I worked out the kinks, and here we are. With no fatalities in, he thinks, months. No fatalities in months. The strongest survived. Of course, it might not have been me, but well, it was. Yeah, you know, let's, let's talk about what you got for sale. <clears throat> of course, he says, tapping a few buttons on the broad device and circling his wrist. The lens beams a cone of light directly onto your eye, which immediately begins watering. Blinking, you see a menu of items seemingly hanging in the air. 
The clawed gauntlets, the jagged memory, the encroaching darkness, blood nanites, Numenera analyzer sounds, safest, artificial eyeball. <clears throat> clawed gauntlets. I knew that would catch your eye, he says, digging at you in the ribs. We plant long hollow rods in your forearms and with steel blades sheathed inside. Just flick your wrist and out they pop, surprising anyone who mistook you for unarmed. He demonstrates with his unoccupied wrist, making little shk sounds. 125 shins for the weapon and the work both. Oh, thank you. What's going on with the jagged memory? This, he says with a raised finger, is a tricky one. It's a mesh that fuses through your skin, leaving jagged marks like tattoos. When you attack, you'll always hit your enemy's old wounds, even if uh, they weren't there before. Told you it was a tricky one. He beams proudly. Yours for 110 shins. The Encroaching Darkness? A beguiling name, isn't it, he says, his laugh lines crinkling. I'm glad you like it, because er, I'm not quite sure what it does. It's a living creature, you see, that crawls around your body while you sleep. Eventually, it takes root in your nervous system and uh, does something shrugs could be good could be bad could be both certainly won't be boring 100 shins what are blood nanites it's quite simple he says the drones fill your blood with millions of tiny machines that promptly begin devouring you alive until they learn to differentiate between your body and anything that's not supposed to be in there after that they'll do their level best to purge toxins and illnesses from your body with every pump of your heart he pauses in case I wasn't clear, this one is really going to hurt. 95 shins. Paid in advance, please. Numenera analyzer sounds safest. It's quite safe, he says, nodding. Most of the time, in almost three out of five cases. And the procedure couldn't be simpler. The drones simply saw your skull open, shove an implant into the right spot, and seal everything back up again. Blast his hands. Once they do that, the implant will help you identify the purposes of unknown Numenera. It costs 95 shins, but it pays for itself. Uh, an artificial eyeball? Really? Very popular item, he says, nodding. The meat ones wear out so easily. This one never does, and it'll help you spot things normal eyes miss. All it takes is a one-time cost of 110 shins and a tremendously unpleasant operation. How painful are these procedures? That is a popular question, he says, and it does vary from procedure to procedure. But if you're seeking a general area, he taps his chin thoughtfully. My customers usually range between shrieking for a merciful death and groaning while soiling themselves, if that helps. But they almost always seem happy with the results when they survive. He smiles. Now, are you ready to buy something? Uh, no, nah, nah, I'm good, dude. You, uh, you have fun. Charger took all your ball drone. Did we talk to the drones? This is a uh, this small mechanical shurgen is roughly the size of your head. At the end of one of its arms, a trio of slender, razor sharp blades flick at the air. It's not clear whether it's trying to sense you or warning you to keep your distance. Examine the drone. The drone buzzes, a warning at you as you lean in for a closer look. The retractable tractable blades leap to your attention. A tiny shaft of light graces the edge of each one, and they taste the air like tiny tongues, but you also notice a panel beneath the blades, fluttering like an insect's wing. Beneath, you catch a glimpse of a row of saw-toothed injectors. Well, cool. If we want to get into weird body modification stuff, we can. Huh. 
Intoxicated woman. Intoxicated woman. Stay away from me. Oh, hey, you look cool. Hello, friend. A smiling, dark-haired woman greets you, standing behind a table of trinkets. Your eyes are drawn to the three small rodents that lazily orbit her head in three floating balls. They take turns hovering just out of reach of the half-mechanical, half-organic cat perched on the woman's shoulder. The smile disappears from her face as a small tremor runs through the ground beneath your feet. That's the seventh time today. She glances nervously at the remnants of the structure next door. When that one fell, I heard them screaming, shrieking like the wind. It was tearing at their bones. Should I abandon my home before it abandons me, I wonder? She idly turns a couple of the curiosities on her table so that the light catches on the various planes and materials. Then the smile returns to her face. Come. Tell me, which of my treasures speaks to you? Much for one of the rodent globes. You mean bay, boo, and bow? She raises a hand and unconsciously pets one of the globes as it swings past her right ear. The tiny creature inside squeaks and scampers in a tight circle <clears throat> before the globe drifts out of sight. They are not for sale, my friend. I hope you are not too disappointed. You seen an albino woman around here? She raises both eyebrows, regarding you silently for a moment. A woman with skin like alabaster. Yes, she was here, looking for help I could not give. Her own treasure was what she wished fixed. I declined. She did not take it kindly, and I haven't heard from her again. She places a gentle hand on your wrist. She is dangerous, friend. She says, her tone light, as if she were merely discussing the weather. Tread carefully wherever you happen across her. She lets go. Uh, what do you have for sale? <clears throat> Leucotic bladder? I'm sorry, what? <clears throat> oh, wow, that's expensive. Ugh. Interesting. Interesting. What does this sign say? Months old layer of dust kicks the sign which reads Gora the Wise, Scholar of the Iron Wind. This facade is all the remains of a house. The rest has collapsed into the sea, hundreds of meters below. You have a name and a knife. The girl stands outside a crumbling old house, playing the flute. Oh, it's a flute, not a knife. She wears a simple dress, and her golden hair falls past her shoulders. The melody she plays is gentle and soft, but it somehow carries to every corner of the street. As you approach, she stops playing and smiles up at you with large green eyes. Chins for a song, sir? How much? It's eight chins for a sad song, or twelve for a happy one? Yeah, play me a sad song. Thank you, sir. This one will break your heart. All right. All right. Girl lowers her flute and looks up at you. Do you want me to play another? Why are sad songs cheaper than happy songs? Because there are more of them, sir. Interesting point. Yeah, sure, play me a happy song. This one should give you a lift. Never felt better than I do right now. Is this your house? <clears throat> Zeb and Nim and I live here. But it's their father's house. He's away. She looks back at the house. Wish he'd come back and fix it. I think it's going to fall down soon. The house is in bad shape. 
She points to cracks around the base of the walls. Those weren't here before. And they're getting wider. We don't go inside anymore except to wash or dress. Then we come right back out. Where did Zeb's father go? He said he was going to go work for someone named the Mimovoira in the bloom. He was going to be a guard. She purses her lips. He said he would come back every now and then, but he hasn't. I don't know what's happened to him. Tell me about Zeb and Nim. They're my friends. They miss their dad a lot, but we still have fun. Zeb watches out for us, and I'm teaching Nim to play the flute. Tell me about you. I was from outside the city, but I've been here with Zeb and Nim since before their dad went away, so now I'm from here. Do you know who lived in the house next door? A lady named Skora. She was a nano sorceress, but a nice one. She let us look at all the things in her workshop. Well, almost everything. There was a room where she said she kept the iron wind. We weren't allowed in there. She frowns. I think maybe something bad happened to her. One day she wasn't there anymore, and she didn't say farewell. What do you know about the iron wind? Just that Skora thought it was dangerous. We never saw it, though. She shrugs. Maybe she was just pretending there was something bad in that room. I don't know. You ever heard of the House of Empty Time? It's a place where children with no family can go to find parents who love them. She shakes her head. I don't need to go to a place like that. This is my home. All right, well, good luck. What's up, Zeb? What you got going on? Boy in rags holds out a hand as you pass. He is far too gaunt for his age. His knuckles stand out on his fingers like knots on a twig. Any shins for a family in need? Yeah, buddy, I got you. Thank you, sir. Good fortune to you. Is this your house? Doesn't look safe. We know, that's why we stay outside most of the time. Ever since Avena noticed some cracks around the walls, we only go in there to change clothes and stuff. Does anyone else live back here? There used to be a lady who lived next door, a nano sorceress, sorceress but she disappeared a while back. And there's a family two doors down. We heard them screaming on the night their house fell into the sea. Shudders and looks away. My sister Nim was friends with their little girl. Tell me about your family. He ducks his head. Yes, sir. There's five. Sorry. Four of us, counting my father. He's gone to the bloom, and we don't know when he'll be back. Huh. Guess I really do think of him as family. I wish we could do more for him. I'm Zeb, and he points towards a little girl kicking a rock in a circle, and an older girl who is playing a flute. You notice that they look considerably more well-fed than Zeb. That's them, my little sister. The girl with the flute is Avina. She's not actually our sister, but she's still family. And there's no one else. That's it. Is Nim okay? She's okay. Doesn't know anything else, really. She misses our dad, though. His eyes cloud. She never really knew our mom, so at least she don't doesn't miss her. What's the what's your dad's name? His name is Zeb too. Zebek Uralau. Ur and it it's been a year at least. He went to work for the Mimravira. For a while he sent Shins back, but then they stopped. Haven't heard from him since. He squirms, uncomfortable. The bloom's like that though. Sometimes it doesn't let anything out. I figure he's just working till it opens up again. But if he's no, he's fine. I'm sure he's fine. What do you know about the bloom? My dad always called it a skist hole. But he said it was the skist hole full of shins, so he was going to pull up his boots and wade in. He shrugs. I don't know much else about it. They say it's a monster and people live inside. You can see it from the caravanserai, but they don't let anybody down there. Well, they didn't let me down there anyway. It looks scary to me. Can't believe dad went down there. Father doesn't come back. You go to the house of empty time. We're not orphans. Our dad works in the bloom. He's coming back. Unless he's... Nope. He's definitely coming back. Uh, Alright, well, catch you later, bro. Hey, Nim. A little girl in a patched tunic kicks a pebble while reciting a song in a sing-song voice. Joy, 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 sorrow. Joy, sorrow, joy, 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 joy. What are you playing? 
She stomps her feet. You ruined it. I was about to get five joys in a... She shrinks back as she realized she just shouted at someone she doesn't know. But my brother usually talks to all the strangers. Can I ask you some questions? Nervous, she glances at the older boy nearby. I guess. Tell me about the game you're playing. It's called Sorrow and Joy. I made it up. She starts kicking the pebble again. First with her left foot, then with her right. You have to kick the rock left, right, left, right without stopping. That's joy. If you kick it twice with the same foot, that's sorrow. Five joys in a row means you win. Five sorrows in a row, you lose. Is there a reason you use the word sorrow? I don't know. I just like it. Sorrow. Sorrow. Joy, joy, joy. What's your name? Is this your house? My name's Nim. This is my daddy's house. He's not home right now. Only me and Zeb and Avina and Mittens, the monster, live here now. We're waiting for Daddy to come back. He said he'd come back now and then. I hope it's now. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry. Who is Mittens the monster? He's our friend who lives in the alley. He Mittens is nice. I think he's sad, but at least he's got us. Zeb turns toward Nim suddenly. Nim, I told you not to talk about Mittens. Looks at you with a sheepish grin. Sorry, sir. Mittens is Nim's imaginary friend. He doesn't really exist. Maybe I can answer your questions. Nim nods. Yeah, Zeb knows everything. All right, let's go find a monster. <clears throat> oh, yes, that does indeed look like a monster. Boy, howdy, that that looks like a monster. Hello, Mittens. Partially hidden in the trash of the dump is a strange and frightened creature. It is covered in chitin like an insect. But its shell looks thin and soft, and its small and malformed claws seem half-grown. It stares at you from its hiding place and chitters incomprehensibly. It exudes a sense of sentience as it watches you, but you sense nothing in its mind, as though it were a common animal. Hey, what are you? The creature makes vague motions with its claws and emits a series of clicks and wet guttural noises. Oddly, you smell dust and lightning. Some of the sounds are reminiscent of a human with digestive trouble, but you're fairly certain it's some form of language. How did you get here? It weaves its head and clicks its claws, then pauses as if waiting for a response. The odor of ozone and stale air surrounds you. When you make no reply in its language, it shakes its head vigorously and says nothing more. Alright, well have a good day, Stitches. Loot! Is she level? She's ready to level up. Nice. Um. <laughs> yeah, let's increase stat pools, right? No, we can't increase stat pools. Oh, okay, I see. Uh, extra effort. Increasing your max effort level will allow you to spend more effort when performing tasks. Yeah, sounds great. Love it. Loot! Yes. The scrawny boy reaches out to you as you pass. Sir, please, sir, I know you saw the stitches hiding in the midden. Please don't tell anyone about him, sir. It's not doing anyone harm. A note. Lord Vuntgen had been stirring up the neighbors, telling them to look for a rogue Stitches, promising them a reward if he's found. The boy gestures toward the west, where you can dimly hear a booming voice and the answering shouts of an angry crowd. They think the Stickus is dangerous, but he's not. You saw his hands. He can't dig like the others. It's not him that's bringing down the houses. What's a Stickus? Everybody knows what Sticka are. They're diggers. They make tunnels under the ground. People around here think they're the reason the houses are falling down. He looks back toward the alley. Except this one can't dig, so the other ones kicked him out. At least, I think that's what happened. Anyway, he's all alone, like my sisters and I, so we want to help him. Well, your secret's pretty safe with me. Thank you, sir. You're a lifesaver. Now, if only we could get him to safety. Maybe I can find a way to get him out of here. Could you, sir? That would be wonderful. If you can find the other Sticka, maybe they'd help him escape. I heard that some of them are down in the underbelly, but I've never seen them myself. Thank you. 
I had a feeling I could trust you. Yes, give me all the loot. Mother to Mars. There were. This woman glares at the air above her head, her fingers fretting with a single bead and a long, peculiar chain of them. Her low, angry muttering resolves into words as you get closer. Foolish boy, shivering at the crossroads, mazed by your choices, go on and pick beauty, pick strength, pick pleasure, whatever that be. The particulars don't matter, boy. What matters is the choosing, and that you do it. Who are you speaking to? She blinks at the empty air, and her hands steal to a metallic mini-faceted bead near the end of the chain. Not you, she says, snorting, but I may as well be. Mother Tamaz knows you, lad. Born falling you were, born in flame, shreds of your smoldering call streaming through the air. When you struck ground, your bead first went cold, then hotter than a mother's hatred. She shakes her head and spits at her feet. Scarcely born you are, and learning quick, but you're still uncertain, all boys and girls are, until they start making choices and dealing with the consequences, until they accept the cost of being adults. Kind of make it sound like there's no good choices. All choices sting, she says, flinging her dishwater gray palms in the air, and the sweetest ones often sting the most, she sighs. You're confused, but that'll change. You'll have your feet under you soon enough. Not all of my children are as lucky. Making a note. This one, she says, showing you the bead she was speaking to before you arrived. It's carved in the shape of a malformed ring. Pic Picul Picio wants to escape his past. He's saved a handful of shins by honest means. That is to say, it's taken him a long time, and he's too busy pissing over the options to spend it. Her fingers fold over the bead. Push him into choosing a path, lad. Do that, and I'll return your call to you. Improved through my art and stronger than when you lost it. Alright, where can I find him? He's Mother Tamaz trails off, closing her hand around the beads, staring into space. In Cliff's Edge. Okay. Talk to him if I find the time, but no promises. Please yourself, she says, with a sour look at the sky. Eritus! He's glowing! And he has a broken airship. First thing you notice about this wiry young man is the golden haze, the glow surrounding him. It sparkles in his eyes and gives his easy grin a warmth that you can feel right down to your gut. He spots you and straightens. I know what you're thinking. How in the world did you survive that crash, Eritus? The answer is, as it always is, backflips. But hold on. How did you know my name? Never mind. Not important. Of course you know my name. I'm Eritus. This guy's awesome. He plants his hands on his skinny hips and beams. This adventure is going nowhere. We are standing still. It is beginning. When? How did you end up crashing the airship? I'm glad you asked. This is somewhat of an understatement. He looks ecstatic. I was climbing up the cliffs to Caravanserai. Caravanserai, to see how impossible it was when I saw a star falling toward the reef. He raises an earnest finger. I knew right then that finding that star was my destiny. He runs his hand through his curls. But what was I going to do? Climb down? Boring! Already did it the other way. Walk? Walk? Worse. Far worse. No fun at all. Tell them about the backflips. No one cares about the backflips. Tell them! Making a note. He grins. Then I saw the airship docked over my head. I raced on up, borrowed the ship, and pointed it right at the reef. His face falls. I don't know what happened next. Despite my expert piloting, the airship steered itself directly up the cliffs. I had no choice. I landed it as fast and as hard as safely as possible. Shaking his head, he sighs. Never did that find that falling star. At this point, someone else has found it, and it's their destiny now. Hey, you're in luck. The falling star was me. No, Eridus shouts overjoyed. Yes, really? It was you? 
He grabs you by both shoulders. This is fate. You were meant to travel with me. You have to. Don't say no. They will lead us to glory. They will lead us to pain. Join them. Join them. Uh, why should I let you join me? He gives you a puzzled look, as if you've just wondered aloud why air is important. I'm an adventurer, he repeats, brow furrow. I thought I told you. Adventure happens when I'm around, and you'll be a part of it. He raises a finger, but you'll have to keep up where we go. He stares at the invisible horizon. We go swiftly, strongly, and most of all, handsomely. He leans in conspiratorially. Until you get handsome, I'll cover for the both of us. Mm, that's a yikes from me right now, dog. You said it, Eretus groans, but you should change your mind. You really should. It's that golden glow around you. Where, says Eretus, turning around. Uh, the owner of the airship wants to have a word with you. That's strange, he says, sweeping a lock of blonde hair out of his eyes. I already talked to him once. I was explaining to him how I needed to borrow an airship. He said no, so I waited until he wasn't looking and borrowed it anyway. Trails off. His golden eyes glow, diminishing slightly. Troubling thought rustles its way onto his face. He's not angry, is he? He's very angry with you. You should definitely try to talk to him. Boy, we don't have... We don't... Wow, I can't believe that worked. Oh, he says, staring at the ground. His glow fades further. If you think it's the right thing to do, he blinks and a wild smile spreads over his face. His aura flares like a star. Yes, it is the right thing to do. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to right this wrong. He strides off to, towards Caravan Sarai, whistling cheerfully. Go forth and right the wrong. Pay the, any price to make amends. Pay any price. I'll remember that. All right, good luck, buddy. Hey, Lord Vunkin. Declaiming to the crowd is a well-dressed but sickly-looking man, short, dumpy, and an unhealthy shade of yellow. Despite this, he has the proud demeanor and stentorian voice of a much larger man. He booms at you as you approach. Ah, another likely fellow. Excellent. The people have called for deliverance from this ravaging stickus, and a hero has answered. Most courageous of you. You are all heroes who stand up in the face of conflict. He smiles. All you have to do is be the first to find the rogue stickus that's been terrorizing Cliff's Edge. Return here and tell me precisely where it is, and I'll take it from there. He pats you on the shoulder, and you'll be rewarded, I promise. As the head of a slave family, I'll owe you a favor, and my favor carries a good deal of weight. Uh... Hmm... I actually don't care to talk to this guy. Why not? Yes. Hey, it's a uh, Pequio. The mutant boy gazes at the entrance to the surgical parlor. Flinching at each scratch of razor metal on metal from within. By your estimation, he is in his late teens, but is the size of a young, malnourished child. His arms are little more than bone wrapped in red speckled skin, and a raw line zigzags down between his mismatched eyes and over his blade of a nose, as if pointing directly at his thin lips. He sees you looking, and bird like muscles flex in his frail jaw. Get a good look, he says, lifting his chin. Or maybe you want to call me some names. I hear eggshell a lot, or maybe lightning bolt. I get that one from time to time. He crosses his bony arms and glares at you. Don't let me stop you. Call me some names. Laugh. Do it now, because in another few minutes, I'll be the one laughing. Um, I'm not, I'm not laughing. I don't want your apologies, I... Besides, you didn't offend me, believe me. I'm used to this by now. I'm not going to be the butt of everyone's jokes anymore, he says. Electricity sizzles within the nearby parlor. This time he does flinch away. Lightning flickers trapped in his determined eyes. 
I have some money, all right? I'm going to use it to change myself. Change everything I can. Trails off, studying you in turn. His eyes widen and he glances quickly away, studying the nearby parlor instead. Is he the guy who could be could be a sign? Mother sent me. I want to help. Oh, he says, blushing. She knows. Of course she knows. And that means you know, too. Choose his lip. Fine. I'm scared, all right? I've had this this ugly face, this body my entire life. Saved up to change myself, my future. Maybe I can become strong enough to deal with the people who hurt me. Or maybe I fix my face. I can do that, but then I'll still be s small. Despite the anger in his voice, tears are shining at the corners of his Making eyes. I can only use the machines in the parlor once, understood. It's too expensive. I spent years saving up all this money and it's not enough to fix me. He opens his pouch to display a moderately imp impressive collection of shins. All this money, at all this money, Tyberg glances over, just in time to see the pouch open. His eyes bulge. Poor lad, he whispers. All that coin must be weighing him down. We should lighten his load. Boy, in this state, I got a hundred scams that would work. Only, oh, if he'd only let me. Um... <clears throat> Before I say anything, I want to ask some questions. All right. I want to know about your past. I already know everything important, he says. <clears throat> he isn't making eye contact. I don't care about where I came from, all right? The future is what matters. Do I have any intelligence pools left? Nope. Nice. Remember that. <clears throat> oh, wait. Uh, you asked, remember? He covers his eyes and begins speaking as fast as he can. My ki parents came to the city with a tribe of people like me. I was born in the underbelly. My first memory is of someone spitting on me. My only friend was a girl named Crooked Keek. And we had to play in an alley so the normal kids wouldn't hurt us. When I was 12, someone killed my father in a bar. And it wasn't even investigated. He blinks hard, staring at the parlor. So I left, and I haven't seen anyone from the tribe since. Let them live off scraps in the dark. I'd rather die up here than down there. How did you earn your money? A shin at a time, he says proudly. I went from shop to shop asking for work. Some of them kicked me out, but others let me sweep once a week or cook. I've done nearly every job in the city at least once. A smile drops off his face. No one ever wanted me to stay, though. They thought I scared customers off. His mouth twists. They were probably right. Okay, I'm done asking about your past. Good. I want to help you decide what to do with that money. All right, he says, softly, staring down into the pouch of shins that's heavy, but not heavy enough. Further proof that money of all sorts is the root of every human, human misery, Tiber murmurs sagely. We should cheer up the lad by removing his golden chains. I can think of better uses for your money besides changing your appearance. Is this this seems like we would steal from him. I don't want to steal from him. Huh? He says, blinking rapidly. He he thrusts out a belligerent lip. Like what? This this is this wow, this was poorly written. Everything up until like this might be the first truly poorly written thing. That's been in here. Uh, persuasion. Tell him to go to the order of truth. Persuasion. Life is too short for worry. Use that money on something fun. Um, let's try. Let's try sending him to the order of truth. I'll remember that. I know what you're saying. But I worked hard to save up my shins. Why should I give them to the Order of Truth? Callie. Oh, dearest, Callie says, shaking her head. I understand. You want to escape your body. Who doesn't? But an education will do more than enrich your prospects. She waves a contemptuous hand at the charcoal parlor. My colleague is correct. Flesh rots, dear. Our minds are the finer tool, the unbreakable one. 
I understand, Puck says, casting one last longing look at the parlor. I guess that's why I was hesitating. I didn't want to spend all that money to temporarily fix half my problem. He gives both of you a tentative smile. I'll talk to the order. Thank you. If anything, her hangry muttering has intensified. She drags the chain of beads between her knuckles, staring into space. What now, my lad, she says. Need to talk to you about Peek. I, what of him? I've solved his problem. Have you? Mother Tama's eyes unfocus, and her fingers trace the borders of the hollow bead. Mayhap you did, she says at last. An education will last him a lifetime, or until his mind fails him as it does some. She shakes her head. I know you did what you thought was right, but I wonder if the lad will use what he learns to overthink his problems from higher up. She roots about in a saddlebag hanging at her hip. Take the call, lad. You earned it. Call. Shield. Offhand. Artifact. Plus 15. Plus 2 might. Only usable by the last castle. Nice. Off with you. You've done enough here. Ooh. Yes. Give me shield. Thank you. Very nice. Ugh. Let's go. We really need to start finishing some of these quests, I think. A yeen. The official gives you an annoyed look. What is it now? Uh, this man has a full pardon. Release him immediately. He scowls at you. You were here before and you didn't have that badge. Do you work for the city or not? Um, I was undercover before, testing you. You did very well, but now I want this man released immediately. He gives you a skeptical glance, then looks over the stay of execution, paying close attention to the signature. Finally, he shrugs. Fine, one moment. He turns and calls to the levies. Unmake the death of the condemned and set him free. He is pardoned. He turns back to you and bows. There you are, sir. All taken care of. Oh, wait. He reaches into his robes and pulls out a smallish bundle. And here are his personal effects, which we were going to uh, give to the poor. Oh, we just gained so much XP, bro. As the levies march off and the crowd disperses, Riss steadies himself, not quite recovered from his ordeal. Finally, he raises his head and focuses on you. If you're the one who got me out of that nightmare, thank you. But where's that? His eyes settle on Tavir. There you are, you slippery bastard. Now, where's the money? If I went through that hell for nothing, all Bastard left me out to dry. I know it. He chokes with emotion. A whole day, Tiber. I spilled my guts up there for a whole day. He steps back, spreading his hands. Tiber steps back, spreading his hands. Er, yes, about the money. You see, Riss, I was hoping to get a reward for turning in the fellow who sold us that brandy without telling us about its secrets. But, but, Riss snarls, there's always a but when it comes to money, isn't there? Should have known. You only said you'd pay me so I wouldn't squeal on you, and you only saved my skin to save your own. He smacks his fists together. Now I am going to have to fight through your friend to get to you, or are you going to step out from behind him and take it like a man? Calm down, Riss. Tell from the beginning. 
Riss spits, then wipes his lips. There isn't much to tell. Captain Silvertongue here talked me into a dirty job, then disappeared like an abacus and left me holding the bag when it all went sour. Oh, Riss, says Tiber, can you blame me for running when I had a chance? You would have done the same, and besides, if I hadn't, we would have both been sentenced to die with no one to free either of us. Lucky that, if my tattooed friend hadn't come along, we'd both be executed in any case. Riss stabs a finger in Tiber's face. You only wanted to free me because you knew you'd be next on the block once the Devourer ate me. Uh, the Devourer would have found you guilty, Tiber? Is this true? As far as it goes, he would have learned about me if he had eaten Riss. And I did manage to escape the levees when they showed up looking for us. But I didn't abandon you, lad. He puts his hand to his heart. Riss, I escaped the levees and saved you from the Devourer of Wrongs because I love you. I did not want to see you die. You have to believe me. Escaping the levees was just good luck. That much is true. Do I, Riss says, cracking his knuckles? Uh, what what was the job? Tiber said we were transporting black market booze to Maharjolios. But he didn't tell me that he'd hidden state secrets in one of the bottles using some liquid Numenera trick, which turned a slap on the wrist crime into a damn death sentence. Death sentence, Tiber says with an uneasy grin. You're alive, aren't you? I'd have told him eventually. Ignorance was supposed to keep him safe. Risk glares at Tiber from under lowered brows. That's a may that's as may be, but you certainly seem to know when the levies were going to come calling. Looks at you. The council somehow got wind of the deal and came after us. Funny how I was the only one home when they knocked on the door. I think I'm with Riss on this one, Tiber. That's right, Riss snarls, and you can start by giving me my share of the spoils. Riss don't know what you're talking about. I never got paid, I promise you. This isn't over, you self-serving bastard. Riss jabs a finger in Tyra's face. Hide behind your friend if you like, but he won't keep you safe forever. Awkward! Yes. Forward. <laughs> Abilities unlock. Issue challenge. Okay. Uh, choose abilities to learn. Skill with defense. Resourceful. Um. Um. Increase, increase the edge. Increase edge in the pool of your choice. Humans, the Sega's protector. Uh, rapier. Can I give this to somebody? Is that how you do that? Broadsword, three physical, plus four damage per effort. Rapier, three plus three, max nine, max four. Light weapon. Speed. Speed. 
I think that rapier might be better long term. Thanks for helping me free wrist, lad. Not that a little in great appreciated. Uh, so was it like Riss said, you only freed him so you wouldn't be implicated? I'd be a liar if I said that wasn't part of it, he says, looking at his boots. But I really do care for the boy and wouldn't wish him harm for all the world. And I could have run. He chooses lips. I could have. Probably not far, though. Do you think he'll make good on his threats? I wouldn't worry about it, he says, chuckling. Riss doesn't have as many friends as he thinks he does. I was practically the only one. Unless he makes friends of my enemies. Best not to think about it. It won't happen. Afraid I'm sort of inclined to believe Rissa's side of the story. Are you, Tyber says, then shrugs. Well, you're certainly entitled to your opinion. All right, well. Thief returned, the merchant says. Flinda wondered why, but did not ask. What did the book look like? The thief said, playing coy and knowing full of well what it, that it was a large book called The Tome of Singing Thorns, bound in the skins of unknown animals, branded with a jagged symbol divided into five different colors, red, blue, silver, gold, and purplish. Flinda knew the word indigo, of course, but suspected the thief did not. Memory curls barbed tendrils around the thief, Linda continues, and it's true. A memory is closing around you. The merchant leans forward with interest, and now he remembers that day ten years ago when he came for the book. Frost burns your nostrils as you stare at the book in the creature's hands. You thought it lost in the fire, but here it is. I wrote this book, you grumble. I, I don't remember what's in it, but it's mine. I don't want to borrow it. I want it back. Yet the customer knew that a book once lost belongs to everyone, Felinda says smoothly. And as such, the customer would settle for borrowing the book for a little while. And with that, the thief returned to the present, swaying and dizzy, Felinda says. Masked cheek propped against a gloved hand. The merchant briefly wondered what memories had carried the thief away, but nothing good could be gained from prying into the secrets of others. And once again, Felinda was exonerated. The thief knew he was a thief. All right, well, catch you later. Yes. Hmm. All right. Let's go. Enough, the airship master says, hands clenched before him as though he means to seize Eratus by his doublet and toss him from the launch platform. You stole my airship. It's too late for apologies. 
Are you sure? Eretus says, cocking his head. I could make up at least three more if it will help. But Master Rinio isn't listening. I demand compensation. My vessel, my source of livelihood, snatched by this, this vagrant. He stares hard at the oblivious glaive. I require justice. I will take it in the form of service. Um... Hmm. Yeah, Eretus, you should you should work off your debt. Work, Eretus says, looking doubtful. I've done work. I never liked it much. It's too much working. The right thing to do. You'll feel good about it later. I will? Well, I do like feeling good about things. He spins round, offering his hand to Renio. I accept your offer. We will work together. Share ideas. Cooperate. We're already having doubts about this adventure. Patience. We don't like patience. Wonderful, Renio says, after a moment's silence, as though he's trying to convince himself. Good. He turns to you with a small bow. We will resume flights to the Valley of Dead Heroes soon. Thank you again for your help in this matter. Tranquility bows as you enter. Welcome back, friend. You have been missed. Like a place to sleep. Wait. I'll remember I'm looking that. for Percy. She gives you a sad smile. Perhaps many people stay here, and this woman might have been among them, but I don't remember her. I'm sorry. She's been talking to Omadon. Well, I won't reveal Percy's secret. Hold on. Hold on, Tranquility Smaz. I'm so pleased, and I'm sure you will be most comfortable. The price is 20 shins per person. Ah, oh, that's expensive. All right, give her the money. Thank you, my friend. Rest well. All right. I'm gonna sneeze. weird. Oh, I was supposed to... Yes. I forgot I was supposed to talk to that chick in the square. There's like a thousand little quests to do in this... in this city. Okay, I, I'm still in the beginning... the beginning town. What's this guy running around for? With alacrity. Oh wait, no, I don't want to talk to that guy. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to bother you. I want to talk to Sigan. Drones still circle the uniformed woman's head. She's whispering to one of them as you approach, but she waves it away and smiles faintly at you. I wasn't sure I'd see you again. Not a dawn. Um, ba -ba 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 -da -da -ba -ba -da. I met a levy in Cliff's Edge that's stalking a man called Finzen and wants an extra year of his life. It wants what? 
Her eyes widen in alarm. She whispers something to one of her circling drones, and it zooms away. Sometimes the levies go wrong. They take a bad year from a citizen and turn out flawed. We never let them live when they get like that. You've seen the little talismans they carry, the symbols of the year that made them. If the year is bad enough, they become that talisman shaped in flesh, monsters that hide in the city and try to bring about the horrors that would have been. You can tell this Finn's in that he's safe. I've sent a squad to bring in the levy. You'll never see it again. All right, cool. Have a good day. With alacrity. Hey, Finzen. He says, slapping a jingling bag into your hand. You earned that. Oh, you should have seen it. Levies came for our friend not ten minutes ago. Chopped him, bound him, dragged him off. Shakes his head, grinning. Levies arresting levies. Would have paid a bucket of shins to see that in the old days. Clopped? Yeah, you know, bounced, bumbered, thumped him upside the head. Fins and sparks. Probably reducing him to parts as we speak. Now what we do now? Head back to the bakery. Maybe. Lots of people in there this time of day. Lots of pastries need decorating, you know? He winks. Or maybe I'll go for a stroll now that the streets are safe again, eh? Well, what, 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 what's the, the main quest is apparently a cast of help build the resonance chamber, okay, so the main quest is to go find Matt Kino. Beloved slave, tell, tell Magger, slaver circus, search for the missing slave girl, convince Rin to join the party. We bring Rin back to her, Tull says that she has valuable, valuable information to trade in return. Oh, so I could, oh, uh, yeah, I don't like that. I think I, I don't know. Borrowed and lost. Find the book, Felinda. Names I borrowed. Tell Lord Vutkin where the stick is, is hiding, or find a way to help it escape. Okay. Search Caravanserai for evidence of Percy's whereabouts. Enter the Anachoic Lazarette. Search for the Sorrow's latest victim at the Dendro O'Hur Chapel. Oh. We shall see. This has been a Weak Tea Gaming video. I'll make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel, punch the little notification bell, maybe give us a like or a comment, and you know what? You have a nice day.